morning. Good morning. Welcome, welcome um, to yet another very interesting session. My name is Eric Motley with the Aspen Institute. This session is really about ways that we think about helping to prepare individuals for the ever-evolving and changing workplace and how we think about traditional modes of education and adapting our educational practices and trainings to better prepare students for that workplace, all of us for that ever-evolving workplace. I should say no more, we have a great moderator in David Kirkpatrick. David, many years ago, 2003, 2004, was a part of a conversation that took place here with Walter, and I would like to say that it was probably the beginning of what evolved into now this Ideas Festival. He is a very well-known technology expert and journalist and recently wrote a book that I highly recommend that all of you read called Facebook. David. Thanks so much. Uh, we had a, when I was at Fortune, we did a conference called Brainstorm here starting in 2003. Um, even before this tent existed, I think in 2004, or they put this tent up around. Anyway. Uh, so I'm a journalist and um, have a company now called Techonomy, which is all about technology as a transformative tool in business and society, and we have a conference. Uh, but what we're going to be discussing is pertinent to that very much because what, this is a very American-focused discussion about how we need to think about education and training as the economy shifts and as the nature of work and jobs shift. And several of us on the panel, um, I guess Craig and myself are the only two on the panel, are part of an initiative that the uh, Markle Foundation has uh, created to try to come up with some recommendations for how to uh, rethink the nature of training and, um, and the understanding where work is going to go as America begins to evolve ever more rapidly because in part of the pace of technology change. I'm sure many of you are aware that robotics and automation are making massive inroads in a lot of industries. At one session the other day here, I saw, uh, I think yesterday, images of these robots in Amazon's factories that move all the goods around entirely autonomously with extraordinary uh, efficiency, and there are very few people in those factories, and that's not the only kind of place by any means that such changes are underway. Um, so we have a very, very uh, eminent group here, uh, which I will briefly introduce, and then I'm going to ask each of them to sort of give a sort of high-level view of how they think of America's educational and training challenges as we move into a new economy. And then I hope we'll have a conversation that is as informal and inclusive as possible. So I really do want all of you to feel uh, perfectly entitled to not only ask questions, but to make comments. And I hope we have mic runners. Do we have mic handlers? Is that how we're going to do it? OK, good. Um, so even in the middle, you can raise your hand, and I might actually call on you. Um, so because I'm a big believer in conversation in these kinds of events. So I want to just start here on my left, your left also. John D.C. is, is it superintendent, is that your title? Mm -hmm. Superintendent of Schools in Los Angeles. And he's doing amazing stuff, as you'll hear. Really amazing. Um, uh, so uh, right, let me just get this in front of me so I don't make a stupid mistake here. Um, John Fallon, who I was going to say that, but I wanted to make sure I was right, is the CEO of Pearson, which is one of the great publishing and education, techno education technology and materials companies in the world. Not only do they publish uh, the Financial Times uh, and half of The Economist, is that it? Yeah. Um, and, but well, they also. You can also, read both halves. You don't have, you don't have to choose. <laughs> you can read both halves, but he also has a very large edu you know, textbook and educational uh, business, very big. Uh, and next to him is, oh, he's not, oh, is he in here? No, he's not on here. John, oh, you are on here. Wow. You came and went, or I you went and it. came. John Palfrey, who is now the headmaster at Andover. Uh, is headmaster the word? It's head of school now. Head of school, yeah. okay. Yeah. But the thing about, he's kind of more from the world of Craig and myself, of technology. For many years, he was the executive director of the Internet, the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard Law School where he is still a professor in addition, 
Are you still a professor? I'm no longer a professor. He's no he longer a professor, but he was a law professor. He's, you're a lawyer, right? I am still yeah. a lawyer, yes. And he's, he's, <laughs> he's been one of the leading people investigating the meaning of the internet on society, so it's extremely interesting that he's now running a high school, effectively. Uh, Craig Mundy is a real practitioner of technology who's been at Microsoft for 22. 22 years? Oh, I thought it was longer. But he's leaving Microsoft. But he, when he was at Microsoft, he ran Microsoft Research, very senior advisor to Bill Gates and, and uh, Steve, uh, Steve Ballmer, uh, now an advisor to Satya Nadella, uh, extremely involved in Microsoft's work with uh, governments around the world, uh, in, involved with American policy issues. He's on the president's what does PCAST stand for again? Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. The President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. So he takes a very uh, professionally national and global view of technology's impact. But I do want to start here with John DC. Talk a little bit about what you're doing in LA and what makes, what, why it has to be different because of the world we're moving into. So um, just a quick bit of context. I have the privilege of being the superintendent for the Los Angeles uh, unified School District. We are um, the school district, uh, second largest in the country. We do pre-K, K through 12 adult education, 909,000 students in 1,019 uh, schools. Uh, L, um, excuse me, New York City is the largest, uh, about 200,000 in terms of uh, a little over our, our 1.2 million youth. Um, very diverse uh, uh, school district. We have about 88% of our youth live in circumstances of poverty and peril. Um, no one um, looks like me in LA. The, the, the amazing diversity of Los Angeles, 109 languages spoken. We translate everything into eight languages every day, so forth and so on. Um, and I think um, what we're doing um, it, it, that's very germane to this panel is really trying to um, produce uh, citizens and the next workforce, um, you know, California's economy is intrinsically linked to the quality of its workforce, and we are the largest producer of that workforce. And I don't need to say much more about California in terms of if it's healthy, the nation will be healthy. If it's not healthy, we will have a difficulty around that. There's no question. So you're taking the whole nation's economic health on your shoulders. Uh, we, we take that pretty seriously. Uh, we lift youth out of poverty. That is, we're not confused about the mission in Los Angeles. But I think um, I'll, I'll mention three kind of factors that are at play at the moment. One factor is the nature of work has changed so rapidly. Uh, so the, I think folks are watching you know, what was Silicon Valley and the emergence of what is now known as Silicon Beach um, down here in Los Angeles. And just the rapid transformation of who is coming to LA and who is employing um, has had a huge effect um, uh, for this. Students in Compton are not competing for jobs with other students in Compton. They're competing with jobs with youth in China. Um, Inglewood with India. There is no question that this is a gigantic uh, shift in terms of this. The second uh, thing that we're um, doing is we've had, a, well, it's a seemingly um, uh, large venture, is this one-to-one -one technology initiative. So we are committed um, in uh, this four-year period of having every single solitary student uh, have a mobile device with digital curriculum um, for many, many reasons around this. But the transformation of students and families um, to a digital world and then their access around that has been stunningly powerful from conversations around power and, and, and who has power and who has access, huge around that piece. Uh, linked learning has been a, a gigantic initiative for us um, around helping people begin in eighth grade um, go to and through post-secondary to the world of work. And so having businesses linked directly with the youth um, as they come into high school for more than internship and externship, but directly into the world of work has, is very, very powerful. Uh, this whole reconceptualization of, quote, vocational um, education. And then I think the third thing I would comment on um, is we are, I am rapidly watching um, a fundamental shift in the high school. And I think um, the high school is just going to simply end its monopoly on the diploma in a very short period of time. And I would argue within less than 10 years. Um, we give diplomas. We are the only one who give diplomas. We have a sole monopoly on the diploma. And I just think that, that is just ending in front of our eyes. 
So we're watching students, and not a few, many, who will walk in on the first day of school and go to the guidance council and say, here's my chemistry class. And they say, no, 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 you go down to room 217, you take chemistry. Um, no, you don't understand. I got this from Stanford over the summer um, in an online course. This is Stanford chemistry. And trying to figure out how the school is going to move from the sole producer to curating courses, um, and that this is going to rapidly change the nature of what high schools are doing, and how students themselves are accessing information and learning. And I suspect we'll have a large conversation around that. This is shifting in front of our eyes. Um, it's powerfully transformative, and it's confounding um, to the status quo of the institution at the same Real time. Real quickly before, I, I want to go next to Craig to try to step further back and talk about the challenges at a more national macro level. But before <clears throat> we, we go on, how you strike, I, I don't think there's that many superintendents of large city school districts that would say some of the things you are saying. Am, am, I, am I wrong that you are a, kind of a pretty far ahead of your industry in general in your acceptance of some of these things? Um, there is um, a certain amount of peril to holding the beliefs that we try to act upon. I think that you, in particular, in, in yeah, LA, yeah, right yeah. Now. I think that's a different <laughs> panel. Um, <laughs> um, but I think I think that um, there is a group of us in the country who get together, who are seeing this change right in front of our eyes, um, and trying to realize that there's this obligation as well as. Uh, this realization that um, we have to figure out this notion of personalized and customized learning that is highly mobile. Um, and the institution of the public school system is the last intact social institution. We feed, vaccinate, do dentistry, do psychiatry, we, uh, this is all what we really? do for, for youth. And so a wow. great deal of responsibility is for us to try to get this piece right. Wow. Okay, Craig, so take a step back and, and comment anything you've heard about what's happening in LA, which I think is exemplary, um, but, and tell me if you agree, but also how does it indicate what our big challenges are? Well, I agree with virtually everything. I'll call him John 1, John 2, John 3. John once said it. <laughs> Actually, my first name is John. I go by my middle name. Okay. But just well, so. you're John 0, then. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, you know, I agree with everything that John Daisy said. That, and, in fact, it's quite remarkable, and I think especially noteworthy, when he said that 80-plus percent of their students uh, come from a place where they are either in poverty or peril or both. And yet, you know, he, he's, he's watching the transformation in, in front of very eyes where those same kids are driving, in many cases, their own initiative to, toward learning and, and discovery, are coming in saying, hey, I took the Stanford course, uh, independent of my background. To me, you know, the, the, the hope for the country is the fact that, you know, youth really are capable and interested in doing these things. We just have to create the opportunity for them to do that, and we have to do it in a very uniform way. I think that no one questions anymore the effects of technology, and, and I think they're uh, happening in two ways notable for this panel. Uh, one is that globalization is creating a, a, a workforce that is distributed worldwide, and therefore we don't have time to mess this up, because once you let all of the jobs or the, the factories of the future migrate away from the country, it'll be really hard to get them to come back to the country. Mm. And so I think that there's a time urgency that many people are not historically used to dealing with in this country, where we had hegemony in so many of these areas that it was sort of whenever we got around to it, we got around to it. And, and I think that day is over and people have to internalize it. The other is that technology is changing what the workplace will look like, that you just won't be able, in almost any job, low skill or even mid skill, uh, jobs be able to function without some command of technological uh, capability. And so my big concerns, in a sense, goes a little bit just past where John uh, lets off, and that's uh, what happens to the bulk of the students after the 12th grade. One, they need to be pre better prepared uh, than they are today. But two, uh, in the United States, the American dream has been pushing people toward saying your kid has to go to college. 
and that meant the, sort of the four-year residential diploma granting institution. But if you look, the statistics are not very uh, encouraging. You know, own, less than a third of American kids now finish college. Um, a huge percentage of them, however, take on a huge debt in trying to go to college. Um, many of the people who get degrees that are not in the STEM fields now find themselves almost unemployable unless they come from elite institutions. And so we're taking on a lot of debt at the family and national level, and those people are not really prepared for the workplace of the future. We used to have vocational training in high schools. It's sort of gone. Maybe it's going to come back in a new form. We used to think community colleges maybe filled what I call this gap area. But they become, in my view, kind of schizophrenic. They don't know whether they're sort of a two-year college prep program uh, or some kind of other you know, uh, uh, training environment. And we don't have anything that's normalizing this across the country at a rate that is going to be necessary for the country's economy to survive. Uh, you hear a lot of talk these days about income uh, redistribution or inequality. And I think this is just the tip of the iceberg if we find that we have almost the, the entire center of the country's population ill-prepared to work in the jobs that will exist in the future. And so I think national security, economic security, uh, social stability, all are hinging on whether or not we can prepare our kids and ultimately retrain our adults you know, to work in this, in this future environment. Thanks, Craig. Um, a lot of things we'll come back to that you've, you've initiated. John Fallon, you know, you're in an interesting position on the panel because you're not an American, but you're running a business that's largely in the United States, in education. What are you most excited about and worried about, about what we can do in this country with our students uh, to prepare them for the future? Yeah, uh, well, I think one of the things I'm most excited about is we have the great privilege and honor of working with John and his team and, and Apple in some of the great work that they're doing in, in LA. And the first thing that strikes me there is, whilst I hear everything that Craig says about issues of college debt, and they are things that we should take very seriously, the link between educational attainment and economic prosperity for individuals in this country has never been greater. And if there's a whole generation of young Americans in LA and elsewhere for whom we are to ensure that poverty is not destiny, we have to tackle this issue. So one simple statistic, uh, the median wage, hourly wage of a worker who could look at a complex passage the prose and interpret a number of nuanced messages from it is 60% greater than a worker who could just look at a simple passage and elicit one simple fact from it. So when we, whatever we want to call college and career readiness standards, we need to remember that's what it's about. And we also need to remember that it's those higher levels of cognitive thinking, interpretive skills and the like that makes you more likely to be employable in this second machine age. Those are the sorts of jobs and skills that are least likely to be automated by the advent of technology. So we still have to study literature and writing, no matter what uh, we're I, do. Hugely yeah. important. The yeah. second thing I'd say is uh, my dad was a, a teacher and then a, a head teacher, a school principal for most of his working life. And I think he would have been somewhat surprised to see me sat in a surroundings as beautiful as this talking about personalized and customized learning. But he did talk all the time, as all good teachers do, about how in a class of 30 kids do you engage and motivate and inspire them each as individuals on their own terms? Or how as a, a school principal do you get frustrated? How do you overcome the challenge you have is suddenly at the end of the school year you find that actually this class with seemingly two equally competent teachers, one has powered ahead and understood these concepts and has done really well, and these have struggled. And you owe it to every kid in the class and every teacher in the school to make those connections in a much more systemic way. Or, or for John, I, I, I don't want to speak for John, but I would guess for John, it's not a challenge finding excellence in schools across LA as it is across the country and around the world. The challenge is how do you replicate that excellence at scale? We know from the PISA studies uh, uh, performance in international student achievement and in America and every other country in the world, we would more than double the levels of educational attainment without spending a single cent more if we could get 
all schools up to the level of the highest performing schools from a similar socioeconomic background. And I think since my dad finished teaching, three big factors have emerged in education that means that is now possible for us to do. And you can see them at play uh, in LA, you can see them at play in Bunker Hill Community College, which is going to feature in the Ivory Tower uh, film that I think has been shown the other night. Uh, the other night, it's the power of technology to engage and motivate young people, but also to enable us to analyse and share and interpret data in real time and apply that knowledge. It's this idea of the new pedagogy that actually students learn best by learning and sharing and teaching each other in a much more collaborative way and then it's the ability to scale that by the way in which you design the schools, the way you do the professional development to organize it so you're not doing one-to-one -one professional development but you're doing it in a much more systematic and teamwork way. So I think those three challenges and it's not happening everywhere in America but it is happening in, starting to happen in LA, uh, Huntsville, Alabama, achieving fantastic results since they moved, often in, in unexpected ways. So for example, uh, they've moved to the, the whole, the same thing that John's doing, this idea of one-to-one -one learning. The incidence of school bullying on buses in Huntsville, Alabama has declined by 70% since they fitted Wi-Fi on every school buses and the kids are much more involved and engaged yeah. in, their own, in their own education. So oh, I, I think these are- games. That, no, no, they are, they are I th so I think this is a, I, I would, you know, if we're thinking one of the themes of this event is this idea of the second machine age. If the first machine age was the industrial revolution which led to universal education, the second machine age, I think, gives us the chance to make educational advancements every bit as great. So I'm, I'm a bull and I'm positive about the opportunities that lie ahead. Quickly, yeah. At some point, I'd like to comment on what's what is emerging in the classroom that are new dilemmas as a result of this? Yeah. Well, yeah. You want to do that? Go, go on it real quick. We'll, we'll get to the so we've had, number three. We've number had about four, three, whatever we call four it. years of full schools one-on-one. -on -one. And one of the things that emerges is truly fascinating. Um, and these are good, these are good issues to, to struggle with. Here to four, education is a deeply, um, uh, uh, uniquely one-on-one -on -one event. Mm -hmm. I produce uh, a piece of product which I physically give mm -hmm. to my teacher. My teacher makes comments on that piece of product and makes an assessment and gives it back to me. I get a grade from my teacher for my work and I learn from this one person. Sometimes there's tutorial, but fundamentally that's how it's worked. This notion of students producing collective work and how one um, curates collective work. I mean, documents are no longer there. And second of all is whose ownership of that and how does that get graded is a totally different dilemma. So student work product is much, much, much more collective and much less individual. And that's one issue that is occurring. And then the second issue that's occurring is that this like just-in-time notion of where you are is producing a very different classroom. And so I don't have to teach the exact same thing to every single student. Um, that day is completely gone. Yeah. And you, we are scaffolding totally different notions of this. So flash mobs have been turning into flash tutorials. So that youth across the school who are struggling with just this concept go here at the end of school. Um, and so you don't get your lesson retaught, you get the place where you're actually right. struggling um, retaught, and that is really changing the nature of instruction and relationship. Just to connect one thing you said, I wanted to ask John F. one more thing before we move on to John P. Um, you, I, just to make sure people in the audience understand, you're saying that we're gonna get to customized, individualized education in part by being data-centric, right? Yeah, but let me say one other thing. What's clear is I think all the international evidence makes this point. This is not about technology displacing bad teaching. This is about yes. technology enabling you to scale and leveraging great teaching because I do think this personal interaction actually becomes more important, not less so, but technology makes it much more powerful. Yeah, well, I richer. want to talk about teachers particularly as soon as we get through all four of you. I think that's a key, key thing to discuss. So John Palfrey, you know, you are somebody who has been a really at the cutting edge of thinking about how society is changing because of technology. And now you've taken on this unexpected role of running what is like the Harvard of, of high schools. Um, 
What do you hope to achieve there, and what has most surprised you about the opportunity and the challenge? Well, thank you. I'm thrilled to be on this panel with these titans. I'm grateful. Um, you know, it was, a, it was an unusual career move to go from being a law professor to head of a high school, but ultimately the reason that I did it, and I think it ties to your question, is that I think we're pretty good at training lawyers in the United States, but I think we've got a lot of room to grow in terms of secondary education, and the research we've been doing at the Berkman Center um, centered a lot on how kids are learning differently. What's, what's different about kids in a digital age who have not known something before, you know, the digital world? All of us grew up with a mix, right, and we kind of learned it. Um, and we worked somewhere uh, even earlier. Somewhere even earlier. I think we're all about the same. Um, uh, and I, I wrote a book called Born Digital, focusing on how are kids, you know, learning differently in, in this era. And it really was trying to respond to what I think Craig said, which in an era where we all agree that the big changes are technological and global, and you know, a variety of other things, how are we actually going to transform education through this? Um, and I just saw a chance to work at a high school that has uh, a, a, an ability to do some of these things and then to share them broadly with a lot of kids. The other thing about Andover in particular that um, was attractive and I think is attractive for this challenge is um, it is a, a famous American boarding school, but it's not, when I pulled back the covers of it, exactly what one might think. It is, there are the children of the elite and I'm delighted that they come, but it's a need blind school and it had applicants from 85 different countries last year and every part of the socioeconomic spectrum. And it's not as diverse as the LA um, school district, but it's, you know, it's 42% um, non-white kids, and it's a really interesting group of kids. They're all excellent. They all have huge potential, and the ability to work with that set of kids and to try some of these things that we've all been talking about um, with some really devoted teachers is really exciting. So just one example of that and why I think it has promise. We've been working with Khan Academy, which Sal Khan is, I know, one of the, the fellows here, and uh, they came in a dialogue to say, how could we, how could we blend the most amazing digital uh, experience that kids could have with the most, you know, uh, sort of classic residential experience? And I totally believe we will reaffirm the importance of residential education, but we will find a way to make the best of these digital bits. So we've been creating problems and, uh, and videos with Salcon in the, uh, the high end of calculus, um, which they didn't have much of, and so we've created several thousand problems, and we try them out with our kids, and they do them in a flipped classroom kind of way, which we talk more about these approaches, and they also were available Just freely. Just briefly define flipped classroom in case anybody Thank does. Thank you. So the, the idea being that you can use the time in a classroom more effectively if you're not just lecturing to kids. And I think most universities anyway and, and a lot of schools have decided it's much better not to be, frankly, in this mode where it's you know, a couple of white guys talking to several hundred people, um, but rather you use the classroom time more interactively. So what you end up doing is the things that you're meant to learn, you try to do those as homework, and then you use the time in Using class. Using video online, et cetera. Video online, exercises, and so forth. But when you come to class, you're actually doing something that is the peer-to-peer -peer learning that John was talking about, or I like the term connected learning. How do you connect up the different yeah ways in which kids are learning. Anyway, by working with Khan Academy, we created all these problems, and now we have a dashboard that shows which problems and which videos are more effective than other, other things. And you think about it, even in the best, most, you know, $75,000 a year per kid kind of classroom, we've never been able to say this problem or this you know, approach to something was a better way to teach mathematics than this one. And now we have a big dashboard that shows 100,000 people trying these problems and showing you know, better pathways. So we, can, we just have new microscopes now and it's such an exciting moment to be able to try them out. Well, you know, the, the last thing you said goes right to this issue of teachers. And I think it's a very interesting topic which did come up as some of our preparatory conversations. You know, teachers are, generally more of the less digital generation, depending on their age. The students are, without exception, even in Compton, I would assume at this point, consummately digital. And what does that mean for our teachers' ability to achieve the results we need to get from them, from any of you? I'm curious to hear that. I mean, we're watching this actually um, in live time. And, and uh, to put an exclamation point on the generation that is born digital, when we were going through how we were going to purchase, you um, try out different pieces in front of whole groups of students. It's, it's how you do a good purchase. And literally, I remember watching um, a kindergartner where a um, high quality textbook was put in front of this person. And the little girl attempted to go like this on the cover of the book. <laughs> and it was a stunning moment 
of, of course it must move like that. I mean, I've known nothing else. Um, so that is a bit of a, it, it was actually a very, very interesting, a very um, important moment. So we watch youth come into school who completely know how to manage technology, and teachers who struggle to manage the technology, youth who have no idea how to um, do a redox equation, and the adult who knows everything on how to do the redox equation in chemistry, and it is rapidly changing the relationship between the student. So I can help you get this to work, and you then can actually help me acquire and apply this knowledge in ways where I own the entire thing before. I'm actually sharing the responsibility for the learning in a way that looks really different, feels very different around that. And then the second thing, although hardly new, um, is that the notion that tech support is of the students, it, we're not, tech support is not the people downtown. Yeah. So inside the schools, the quote, geek squad, the tech support is absolutely uh, the youth uh, around this I mean, this it's just piece. like the kid in the third row kind of thing? Oh, exactly. Because the but, teacher knows so little and they know so much? And they just come to the classroom, I'll set you up, I'll get you going. Um, so there's a very different relationship <laughs> Um, which I think is rapidly enhancing and breaking down a wall that was, I can contribute to you contributing to my learning. And that is, does it, I don't want it to sound that soft because it's not that soft. It is um, uh, the power of efficacy for my own learning is emerging in a way that we didn't anticipate. But it, it actually creates the opportunity for a kind of collaboration that's, between teacher and students that we haven't seen before. That's interesting. That's John correct. Paul, for you, had something. I think that's extremely exciting, and it's an important piece of it that you know, I, I think that kids do have a ton to share, and they're learning things that can come into the classroom in ways that they couldn't before. But I wanted just to mention on the teacher front, I think often people perceive that it's a generational issue with teachers, too, that you have the older and tired teachers that you know, are less likely to try these things. You've got the young Turks coming in, and it's all going to be great. And I, just as a, as a tiny anecdotal experience, of our 200 teachers at Andover, some of the cranks have been the young kids, and some of the people who have been most psyched about this and completely you know, rejuvenating their teaching have been the 64-year-old you know, guys who are a couple years from, from retiring. And you know, they often come in skeptical. But then you know, they look at it and think, oh my gosh, I could do that with this? You know, and it's actually it's a completely wonderful thing that I've observed. And I, I imagine you may have seen some, some of it in your school district. So, so, so do, how serious is the fear of displacement that, that teachers inevitably must feel as they see these technologies emerging. I mean, John. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, if you look at the evidence from sort of national surveys and the like, I think these Johns are very much at the forefront of where it's at. Yeah. The evidence is that now technology is being used very effectively in most schools for the more sort of routine. So, you know, the handing in a homework, the more routine assessment, uh, taking attendance Black and all that sort of stuff. Things. Yeah, the, the sort of basic automation and administration of, of basic functions, but we are still in the very, very early stages of using it in a much more sophisticated and value-added way. I don't think that's because teachers won't do it. I think it's they need help to be able to do it. And I think this is where this whole idea of professional development comes in. And actually, just, you know, Put, taking it beyond these shores for a minute, if you look at the highest performing school systems in the world, places like Japan, Singapore, Shanghai, one of the things they are really good at is extending this idea of collaborative learning, not just from teachers and students, but actually across the teaching faculty. And so how teachers can help and learn and share with each other, I think is fundamental to this. And I think that's, again, one of the exciting things that John's doing is, the technology and the pedagogy are really just the lever to do the most important thing of all, which is the systemic change in the, the teaching and leadership of the school district. I think that's. I wouldn't make an observation, possibly a prediction. I, I think the country is um, having lots of polarized conversations in education around uh, testing and, and common core and all that kind of stuff. I actually think what's happening um, almost without recognition is that there is an unbelievably transformative event taking place as a result of the testing in the Common Core. I mean, the country has two consortia, Park and Smarter Balance. The notion that there's no more paper and pencil test and that this is a computer adaptive assessment has probably moved the PD thing more rapidly than What's this. What's that acronym? 
Computer adapted. Oh, oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Yeah, but professional development. Professional development. The, uh, than almost anything else. The idea that students do not take a paper and pencil test, at least at this national level. I mean, it's affected teachers. The oh. way teachers think. Every, all of that. us. Yeah. All of us. Uh, Fascinating. Give me a, a practical example of that. So I think I'm right in saying the 1990s. California tried to introduce this idea of collaborative learning into a high stakes assessment and they tried to test it, right? And so all these kids work very well and very effectively together on projects until there was a high stakes assessment, at which point the less able kids started to defer to the more able ones, uh, the dominant kids started to impose their views on everybody else. Uh, and the one thing all the kids learned was they never wanted to engage in group learning ever again, which, you know, given that when they go out into the world of work, the thing they have to do is, 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 is work as part of a team. The way we can now do, assess that, is in real time. So as the kids are working on a project and as they're working and engaging with each other in the chat rooms, we can use the technology to see who's playing each role. Right. And we can coach the kid to say, well, why don't you take a more disruptive role here? Or why don't you take a leadership role? Or why don't you just step back? Or this child needs that bit of extra knowledge. And it changes the whole dynamic of it in an incredibly powerful way. So, so I think that's the difference between where we are and where we're there's going. There's a certain now. amount of op I want to hear in a second, Kurt, but there's a certain amount of optimism on this panel that I don't want to poison our discussion because, you know, you, you, you were talking about how the, if we could all do what the excellent schools do, we'd be in great shape. But I'd like you, could you work with school systems all over the country, to give me a rough estimate of how many schools would you call as excellent as a percentage in the United States, K through 12? Um, well, I mean, we can see if we look at, uh, if we look at the, the most recent NAEP survey, I think I'm right in saying that something like 24% of 12th grade students yeah. uh, are considered to so be ready that's a rough percentage for career for and college. So that's probably the best of students. Yeah, and I, would, I, I, and I would probably say at the moment the number of schools and school districts that are really using technology in the way we've described would be 5%, yep. probably no more than 5%, that. 5%, thank is you. That, is that, would you share and that? Both I think those yeah. would almost overwhelmingly be the most affluent communities, I would assume. No, not, not necessarily. No, no, you're, not, you're a really uh, interesting case because LA is so diverse. I, I think, but I think I the, the reason I would say that is I think that it's changing rural America school faster than anything else around the idea really? for distance learning, yes. Oh. And, I, and, I, and I would say, in terms of delivering out, applying technology to deliver outcomes, in many ways, Bunker Hill Community College is doing at least as important work as Harvard just up the road is doing. Okay. So I don't think you can make this distinction. But I think 5% of schools true, doing yeah. this kind of stuff but is a salutary no, no. fact to have in the discussion. Craig. Two things. That, <clears throat> I, I think it's very important, the point that was made about sort of continuous observation. You know, we used to basically teach and then we'd try to test to determine competency. And now what, employers want is they, they don't want the diploma as some assessment of that. They want to know in detail, you know, how, is the competency there uniformly at every stage? And it's such a powerful data-driven way of doing this, but it really requires that you set aside the idea that there's an ultimate evaluation. Evaluation is a continuous thing, uh, and, and that's a change. I also, to David's point, want to uh, reinforce, I'll say, the 5% problem. The hysteresis in the system is going to be very high. But what does that word mean, Fred? That, Fred Craig? That, Sorry. That, hysteresis? That, I don't even know what that word means. <laughs> that, 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 it's, a, it's a physics term, but it basically means that things, you know, sort of once they're moving in one direction, they don't want to easily move in another direction. Okay, thank you. You can kind of, that's momentum, no, really. Thank but, you. Yeah. but you can push hard, and then they want to come back. Okay. There's sort of a rubber banding effect. Back to effect. the point. Yes, good. And, you know, we've seen it with a lot of the discussions about the teachers and the role of the teachers and the, and the development of teachers. One of the things I've been fascinated to watch in the last two years is as the MOOCs have emerged and gone into the higher education environment is to now watch even the elite collegiate level professors resisting allowing these things to be used in the universities. Yes, yes, yes. So if you don't think that there's going to be a problem, you know, just because of fear, uh, you know, we would make a big mistake. And so I, I think it's going to be very important to realize leadership matters. It's why we have LA doing what it's doing, not any other reason. We've got to find a way to, to provide some comfort to people that, that they're going to survive this transition. Because without that, the resistance that's going to be in, in there is going to make it very hard to move quickly. And yet, 
it's clear from the, the, the leadership places that, that the results can be fantastic. One, one more thing while you're talking, Craig, because you know, we haven't talked as much as I would like about the skills that need to be created by all this and the kinds of jobs these people are gonna occupy. And those things are changing so fast, which is something you think a lot about professionally. Does it worry you that those things, the jobs and the skills necessary, will change at a pace that the educational system simply can't keep pace with? No, I, I think, well, the education system as it is today clearly can't change fast enough. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it couldn't change. The reason I also like John Dacey's comment about, you know, they won't have the monopoly on the diploma is I don't think people are gonna find that they get schooled once anymore. I think That's school right. is gonna become a continuous yes. process and that uh, adults, uh, e even those who have professional levels of education and employment, are gonna find out that their you know, vaunted you know, diploma is no longer a ticket to ride anymore after yeah. a certain point in time. Right. I think you see it in the current jobless recovery. Right. You know, why are so many people with you know, four-year degrees from high-quality institutions unemployable yeah. today? It's because the market has moved beyond them. We have got to get everybody back into a mode where they're going to be getting the, their, their sort of ticket punched over and over again, saying, I've got another credential right. that now matches to a job skill that the marketplace needs. Great, thanks. Paul Free. At the risk of quarreling with the moderator, I wonder if the right question is at the unit no, of analysis. Right. Quarreling is the best thing on a panel. Good, so. I'm, trying to, I'm trying to mix it up. Go ahead. If the unit of analysis isn't how many really good schools are there, it's really how many good learners do we have. Yeah. And I actually think that might link up a yeah. few of the things that people have been saying, which is if you think about it as learners who have you know, varying degrees of support, right, from the least supported by their family and otherwise to the most affluent and most supported, and you've got a series of scaffolds that come along, which include schools, they include libraries, and I understand now now the LA libraries are offering high school degrees as a, as a potential competitor with the school district. So you've got lots of different institutions that That's help. Right. But you've also got institutions like Stanford Online High School, or you've got yep. you know, the Khan Academy, or other things that people can make their way through, and that that's a much longer continuum and a different way to think about it. Well, um, you wrote a book called Born Digital, which is interesting, and what I've been struck by is the optimism that these two guys show about the kids' ability to kind of figure out what they need for themselves. And I think that's encouraging, you know, the, the bus thing, they're not playing games, in your opinion. No, and you've said games. several things so that, clear, that yeah. you know, the coming, the coming back <laughs> to the, the, it might be good anyway, games. The coming back yeah. to having yeah. already done a chemistry. Yeah. Yeah. Education yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, do, you, do you think the kids are going to, at some level, drive this with their own understanding of the problem in any way? So if, you know, yes. I may, absolutely. I, if I had a glass you that's do. like that much, I'd be a glass half full person. I, I totally believe in the kids to show the way. But really? I don't think it happens on its own. Um, one of the things we tried to do in this book was to take, people talk about this term digital natives, that kids you know, are natively you know, doing this kind of thing. I think kids are intuitive in this way, but there's a huge gap between the most able and the mo least able to do this. And that preparation gap, what we used to call the digital divide, is enormous. And I'll just take one little example. So with our, um, our high school, of the kids coming from all over the world into mathematics, we have 22 different entry points in mathematics alone. Hmm. So from the least prepared to the most prepared, that is a huge range. And these are all kids who show enormous aptitude, right? The point is it doesn't happen on its own because the kids are you know, so amazing. Now, some kids can absolutely, Joey Ito, the head of the MIT Media Lab, this is a kid who could find his way through any you know, system and ultimately without a college or graduate degree be the head of this amazing institution. They're gonna be the Joey Itos, but they're gonna be kids who need more help along the way. And yeah. so I actually think it's our, our goal is to say, yes, the kids are more able, they are gonna teach us stuff, they are more kind of intuitive in these environments, but we've just gotta figure out our scaffolding and our supports in different ways. Yeah, I think that's, um, I think that's a point worth um, doubling down on. So I think we see that and we know that uh, inquiry um, and uh, investigation are, are intuitive, uh, but acquisition is not. And that has to be facilitated. Um, and that has to be, um, as we're watching, customized in its facilitation. I, I wanted to go back and link this. Are, are teachers worried about this yeah. uh, kind of piece? I think teachers are worried at a number of levels. And one of them is, is really worth just putting out there, and that is we're a profession who tends to make its decisions when we know we have got something that is near or perfect, and when it has taken a long time for us to say this is good. That is just not gonna be the nature of this. It is gonna be an iterative process for which we will grow from knowledge of the imperfect. Mm -hmm. And that tends to be very much against how we think in 
education. Yeah. And it is exactly... That's a problem in business as well but at it's the moment, all, But it's way. exactly yeah. what we expect students to do. Yeah. We expect students to get better each year. I'm not so sure why we're, we're so hard on ourselves around this issue. Well, yeah. back, back to, you know, again, look at the highest performing school systems in the world. They have a culture of learning. They also have a culture that really celebrates and promotes the status of teaching in, in society and values it, uh, perhaps in a way we haven't always done here and, and, and in other countries in, in the Western world. So I think really promoting teaching as a profession and as something that we really value and promote and recognize in terms of professional development, economic value and the like, I think is also something that's really important here. To this acquisition idea, you know, John used two terms that I think are very important for people to understand, John and Daisy. He talked about personalization and customization. And you know, at first glance you could say, well, aren't those the same? And in fact, they're completely orthogonal. Yes. You know, one of them is basically customizing what you're going to learn. And the reason that's so different is in the past, that was completely uniform. The right. standard tests, the standard courses, the standard core curriculum. That was all not about customized anything. That was about standardized. So we want to move from standardized to customized on the curriculum. On the other side, there's personalization. That's as opposed to broadcasting. You know, I mean, here what we want to do is use the data to create the optimal way to teach each kid their personal curriculum. And, and, and where it's important is what their personal curriculum is, has got, they've got to have help picking that. Because otherwise, they'll just be guided by, you know, whatever's sort of intriguing to them. And the marketplace really has to become a component of deciding what is it they should be trained on. So what you want is a perfect match, or as perfect a match as you can get, between what the job market will require and what their interests are. And then you, you fill the gap in with a customized curriculum that you deliver to them in some personalized way. And, and just on that, I mean, most of the rays of hope of innovation and good practice so far we talked about in the, the, the kindergarten to 12th grade space, but there's actually some good things happening in, in higher education and college as well. Look at what uh, Howard Schultz at Starbucks announced last week yeah, with Arizona fantastic. State University yeah. trying to give every single Starbucks employee the chance to complete their higher education. Uh, we're working with companies like uh, Cisco and Unilever and L'Oreal to start to design degree courses with those employers where part of it is the students actually, for example, on a marketing course, get to present to the CEO of Unilever what their marketing campaign or idea is. And the most successful ones then find they're taken on for internships, work placements and, and careers. I think we're going to see a lot more of that. And then I think we've also got to do two other things. One, start to measure competence, not length of time. So if you've demonstrated that you have all the capacity and capability to do this degree in IT in six months, why do we make you wait three years before you get the, the certificate? And given, I think, the biggest, you know, even bigger than the problem of graduates with student debt is the number of people who have not graduated and not completed college. You know, 50% of students haven't completed in five years, but they've still got the debt. How can we give them credit for what they have completed so that they can get badged, accredited, rewarded from employers and move on, isn't it? That's, Unlocking wow. that is going to have a profound effect in the near-term economy. Unlocking it how? So the amount of folks who have, I mean, we still, in my opinion, unfortunately in this country, uh, link the degree to, to intelligence. I mean, that's kind of, it's your ticket, you get employed when you can produce this degree piece as opposed to what you can apply and what you can contribute and what you can create, which is not necessarily linked to the degree. The number of folks with an incomplete post-secondary, um, if that could be changed in the very short term, you're going to have a very, very uh, profound effect upon uh, the economy. Well, I know you also Positive. Be believe that companies can have a big role in the ongoing educational uh, training for even beyond their own employees. Yeah, right? I, I do. I think the nature of the academy is going to shift. I think there'll always be the Harvard and Stanford and, and the, I could name them all. But I actually think... The, it's going to look very different very quickly. I think there's going to be Google University. I think there's going to be Amazon University. I think there's going to be um, Boeing University, where they are simply going to produce a customized uh, post-secondary experience 
directly relevant to me being able to hire them at Boeing to be the employer I need at Boeing. But other people can benefit from that who don't end up working there, of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, this is such an extraordinary conversation, but we definitely want to include you in it. So, okay, there's Kirsten a hand that University. went she's right up, so let's get a mic University. for that guy. <laughs> and I want to get through the audience stuff so. with a lot of people having a chance, so it can be a comment, it doesn't have to be a question, and make it brief. And Great. identify yourself. Mike Pack. Great discussion, guys. Hey, my question is, could you describe the classroom, uh, first grade to 12th grade, as it relates to textbooks versus computers? Are kids bringing their own laptops in at what age? Or when you walk into a science you know, class, are the computers already there? Or how does this work? I've just been out of the classroom for a while. So 95% um, of the classrooms in this country look like you remembered. Um, so we should probably like say that up front. You mean um, the way they've looked since 1880? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chairs bolted to the floor. That's right. Yeah. Um, but where it's transforming, um, you're watching a complete uh, digital content. So the library is digital. Take a look at a company, for example, like LightSail. I'm not making any, this yeah. is you should go out and do that. I'm just making an observation. The entire library for first grade, the entire library for ninth grade, all the entire volume that you would take a look at, both um, in what we would call a fiction and nonfiction, completely downloadable, you take it home. Your, um, your device is mobile, um, so learning is taking place uh, on the playground, learning is taking place in the traditional classroom, learning is taking place in the kitchen table, the bedroom, et cetera. But I think some of the greatest pieces um, of change is that the um, product of student work is completely digitized and the portfolio. So students talk, do not talk about handing in their paper, they talk about an, a piece of evidence in their portfolio, which is widely shared wow. around that piece. And therefore, the very nature of customized tutoring, customized tutoring is changing. So there are students who go home, log on, and their tutor is in India, waiting for them. Um, because of the obvious time zone, and we set them up to help them with that. And piece. the schools, public schools help make that possible? Yeah. Sometimes? Wow. Yeah. Okay, back there. Hi. <clears throat> you know, uh, in the field of healthcare, uh, when we want to test something, um, we uh, do research on it. We call it clinical trials, right? Um, my limited exposure to the education industry tells me that there's not very much research done, uh, at least compared to the healthcare industry. And even if there is research, um, it's not very widely disseminated because I don't see as many papers being published. Why do you think this is the case? And how can we change it? Uh, I, think this is, I think this is starting to change. So in case of Pearson, uh, we, I've made the commitment that by 2018, for everything we do as a company in education around the world, we'll report on the learning outcome that results from that work, just as we report on any other metric. And I think all these changes that we're talking about is making that possible now in ways than it ever was before. And so everybody might call it, we talk about efficacy, many other people talk about learning outcomes, but I think one of the biggest changes that's happening at the moment, and it's a great unifying force across civil society, public organizations, the private sector, is everybody I think now is understanding we've got to talk less about inputs into education, like teacher class size, teacher pupil ratios or whatever, and outcomes, what we've actually done to improve literacy or numeracy or employment levels or, or whatever the measure may be. So I, I agree, this is a great question and, and there's a lot we can do. I look forward to you know, doing that myself and, and, and I think others who are really focused on what assessment is like using data and so forth. But I also think we have to keep in mind that some of these things are gonna resist this kind of measurement. So I would just take in the context of being the head of a high school. I'm interested, as interested in the morals and the ethics and the way these kids relate to one another as I am in their outcome in calculus or whatever. And those things I think we, maybe you can study them qualitatively, maybe you can, we're doing longitudinal studies that where the kids talk about it. But actually I think I just wanna make sure that as we rush to measure it well, we also think about what are the kinds of other things that we're trying to accomplish in these schools and do that really well too. Yeah, our discussion up to now, you wouldn't even know that schools might want to teach morals and ethics because that is a pretty important part of what kids ought to take away from this. And you sort of hinted at it with the literature and the writing thing at the beginning. But anyway. Yeah, and, and, and Cardinal Newman made the point 150 years ago about the purpose of a university, the point he made about the human interaction. And what's really, really important, this is not about the automation of education, this is the personalization yes. of education, and there are still th things that are hugely important 
the most important things are actually the things that are hardest right. to analyse and assess right. in right. some ways. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't hold no. ourselves That's to account for that. Thanks. Uh, Identify needs, yourself, please. Yes, Tina Walls. What needs to change at the university level to help create great teachers? And what needs to help at the hiring, at the point of hiring them, to make sure that we get great teachers in the classroom? Hmm. Start with a total redesign of teacher ed. Just completely just pretend it didn't happen. Um, uh, because, it, and, and, and just completely redesign this piece. Time for B2. With, yeah, exactly. With deep, deep clinical experience. Um, and I think that that would be one piece. I think the second piece is um, the notion of who we want to attract into this profession. Uh, has to be completely turned upside down. And so until we think about this as how we have historically thought about the lawyers mm -hmm. and the um, doctors and the engineers, that being, quote, iconic professions, that has to be the way we think about this um, in the same motion along with a good clinical piece. And I, I think that one of the things that the, the, the federal administration could do, um, which would be, it does lots of things, but to notion of granting a dozen totally new teacher preparation organizations on a nationwide bid along a set of specs, maybe Boeing actually will get one of them. Maybe um, Harvard will get one of them. But the idea is that it does not have to be relegated simply to the academy if this is the spec about how we would prepare teachers. Okay. A thought. Here, and then we'll get the mic back there, and then there, and we've got five more minutes, so let's go fast. Uh, Kim Garner. Um, the whole notion of, of the way we went to school is you looked up to your teacher to help you educate. That's all now been flipped. How do, what can teachers do, and what's that relationship between the kids looking at their teachers and not respecting them, so to speak, because the kids often think, well, I know more than you because you're not tech savvy, or you don't understand how do you do that. So what skills do the teachers need to earn that respect and be open? So I, I don't think at all kids are not going to look up to their teachers. I, don't, I, I think that would be an overstatement of what we were saying about kids learning from one another and, and teachers learning from them. But take a very small example. I taught a course this spring. Um, it was on hacking. And the same kids had taken a, this class with me on, in the winter on hacking. In the spring, um, they wanted to take a class. I hadn't prepared any new material. They wanted me to do it again. They said, fine, why don't you guys come up with a curriculum? I will approve the curriculum. I will meet with you once a week. And you, know, you guys will have to teach the class the other two days a week and so forth. Um, and at midterm, you have to write me an essay about kind of what you missed in the teacher. 201, the kids at the midterm said, oh my gosh, we need a teacher. When you are not there, it is terrible, and here's why. And you know, this is all after them complaining you know, about what I did in winter. So in any event, I actually think that one of the things is, of course they're always going to look up teachers, but I think we actually need to get kids to see what are, the, what, are the, what are the roles the teachers can play that are really constructive, and what are the roles the kids can play that are really constructive. Yeah, great. OK, back there, okay. and then we'll go there. Yeah, Candace Olson. So, um, uh, at Fullbridge, we're actually working in this career acceleration space, and there are two things you guys have touched on that, that I would just love anyone else's comments on before or after the, the comment. One, one is, um, we're being asked surprisingly to come in and do teacher re-education, both in the state of Florida and also in Saudi Arabia with vocational women's schools. They're asking us to take all their faculty, put them into the immersive programs that we've been offering the kids, and the reason is they're arguing that the teachers have to experience this in order to really get what it feels like to be in a flipped classroom what to be scored, you know, to be judged in terms of a team. So it's kind of interesting because we didn't see that coming at all, and so it's been interesting your comments. And the second thing is, wait, really, wait, let's, can we stick to one thing because sure. we have so of little course, time? Of course, yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. I, I would completely agree. The ability to experience anything, what we would call blended learning or flipped classroom, um, it's just like anything else. I can't, if I can't visualize it and touch it, I'm not likely to be able to acquire it, and it's hugely helpful. Okay, that's great. Yeah, very much so. Absolutely, teachers are open to this. Hi, Asha Jadeja from Palo Alto, California. Um, one question I wanted to ask you is about the sort of the school and the cloud experiments that have been uh, that are being done by uh, Professor Shugata Mitra and Nick Negroponte and these guys. And the school and the cloud, uh, you know, model has been about sort of teaching kids yeah. uh, in little peer groups where they learn from each other in small groups. Um, and there's a specific spatial design for that. Uh, the results seem to be phenomenal. I actually just just set up a, my own school in the cloud in 
in a, in a town in India, and the results are just unbelievable. So is that, I mean, the, the learning from that is that if the teachers are there, but not really in the classroom teaching, uh, and, and, but they're sort of there as facilitators, is that, I mean, are you guys using some of this stuff from school in the cloud to inform your own thing? Because it's, it's a 15-year-old study, and we have millions of data points on that. I mean, we have, we have uh, 50,000 students, K to kindergarten to 12th grade students, studying in virtual public schools where the children do not come to physical school at all and they learn all virtually. Interestingly, they tend to be some of the most disadvantaged kids. They're not choosing to be homeschooled. They've been excluded from the system in, in one form or, or another. Uh, they still get in very personalized support as they work, as they reach virtually early days, but the, the data suggests actually they can make good progress certainly better than they would have done otherwise. So I think that's just one example of all sorts of ways in which this is gonna, gonna play out on a whole spectrum uh, with di different degrees of virtuality. Is that in the United States? That's here in the United yeah. States. And yeah. who pays for that? It's paid for by, it's a public school. So it's right. a, oh, public school so it's a charter it school right. that is publicly funded by the state an in the same way. An online charter school in effect? It's an online charter school and some of them will be where, where is parents. Where that happening? It's happening in pretty much every state two, across America. Two really? million kids are homeschooled in the United States right now. And but I didn't know there were online charter schools paid for by the public education. And some money. of them will be parents of choosing to homeschool. Some, some will be yeah. kids for reasons of health, disciplinary or social reasons okay. have been excluded. We unfortunately have to wrap, but any of the four of you have urgent final thoughts that you didn't get out? Because it's been an amazingly good conversation anyway. Thank you portrayed us as being very positive. I think there's still a tremendous amount of fear um, about um, how fast we should be moving around this issue. On and the I part of whom? And the part of the system, and the part of the people who work in the system. It is a very unsure area that we're moving forward in. And I think that that is, requires some attention. And it requires Great. real urgency. Urgency, yeah. I hope all of us took a, a sense of urgency away from this conversation. Thank you. I know I did. Thank you so much.